Good evening. I'll bet you uh, have never experienced this. You're at church and um, one of the young guys gets up before the sermon. He has the scripture reading before the sermon and he says, the scripture reading tonight is uh, from Song of Solomon chapter 1. And then he proceeds to read these words. She, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than wine. Your anointing oils are fragrant. Your name is oil poured out. Therefore, virgins love you. Draw me after you. Let us run. The king has brought me into his chambers. Others, we will exalt and rejoice in you. We will extol your love more than wine. Rightly do they love you. She, I am very dark but lovely, O daughters of Jerusalem, like the tents of Kedar, like the curtains of Solomon. Do not gaze at me because I am dark, because the sun has looked upon me. My mother's sons were angry with me. They made me keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyard I have not kept. Tell me, you whom my soul loves, where you pasture your flock, where you make it lie down at noon. For why should I be like one who veils herself besides the flocks of your companions? He, if you do not know, O oh, most beautiful among women, follow in the tracks of the flock and pasture your young goats beside the shepherd's tents. I compare you, my love, to a mare among Pharaoh's chariots. Your cheeks are lovely with ornaments, your neck with strings of jewels. The others say, we will make for you ornaments of gold studded with silver. She says, while the king was on his couch, my nard gave forth its fragrance. My beloved is to me a sachet of myrrh that lies between my breasts. My beloved is to me a cluster of henna blossoms in the vineyards of En Gedi. He says, behold, you are beautiful, my love. Behold, you are beautiful. Your eyes are doves. And she says, Behold, you are beautiful, my beloved, truly delightful. Our couch is green. The beams of our cedar, the beams of our house are cedar. Our rafters are pine. I am a rose of Sharon, a lily of the valleys. I'll, I'll guess that you've probably not heard that scripture reading uh, very many times, especially by a young fellow in church. Um, I could be wrong. But we don't read often from Song of Solomon. And to ask a, a young boy to read that, you might be risking him or his buddies breaking out in laughter and giggles. Uh, that's uh, Song of Solomon chapter 1 and a verse into chapter 2. And it reminds us of this book we're considering in our quest for wisdom, uh, the great song, Song of Solomon. Um, if you didn't get the first session last week it's it's available you might want to look at that first before you really dive into this one with us we're going to start <clears throat> talking because last time we, we we suggested that we really ought to take this book as literally as we can understanding that it's poetry but um, I reject the idea that this is an allegory and it's talking about something other than uh, a man and a woman and their love and desire for one another. Um, I think that's exactly what it is. Uh, but uh, there have been different views down through history, uh, for instance, uh, taking it as figurative totally, and it's really talking about the love of Christ for his church or God for his people. Uh, we talked last time about why we, we uh, have moved away from that view. So, taking a more literal approach, um, and that's really the way most scholars today approach the book, um, there are several varieties of the literal view. I just want to present a couple of, of them to you, and then uh, maybe a, a little more moderate literal view that is helpful to us. So, there is a view of Song of Solomon that sees um, 
that, that suggests there are th three basic characters involved in the story. Um, and this view sort of looks at the song as a drama, almost like a play, a, a love p poetry play. Um, and the drama highlights the love of a young woman, a maiden, for a young shepherd boy who is her love interest. And so there's two of your characters, the young maiden and the boy, the shepherd boy. And this is over against the third character, who is Solomon, uh, the king. And Solomon is trying to win the heart of this young girl and basically take her into his harem. We know that Solomon had uh, many wives and concubines at one point in his life. And that this view, this theory says that what we see in this book is these two young lovebirds and then Solomon is trying to steal her away and take her into his court and into his harem. Um, a, a variation of that view is that uh, the maiden, the young girl, is already in Solomon's harem and she's trying to escape because she's in love with somebody else. Okay? That's an, a variation of the three-character view. Uh, and it goes on to say that Solomon is is sort of the loser in this. He is defeated in his attempt to win her or to keep her, whichever view you take. And she escapes and and is able then to be with her true love, the shepherd boy. Sounds like a modern movie, doesn't it? Uh, it's a very dramatic approach to the book. Um, you might even see it reflect a little bit in the translation I read from there at the beginning, because you notice it was almost in play parts. She said something, then he said something, and then a group of others said something. Um, and, and so that's that's sort of along with this view. Um, and, and it's very dramatic, but there are all kinds of ways to, to poke holes in that and, and show how that is not a, a consistent way to understand this psalm. Um, but there are people who believe that way, that, that teach it that way. A second major way of approaching it is to say there's not three characters, there's two characters. So it's sort of a two-character view. And that is that the song is about Solomon's devotion to his one true love. So there are two characters, Solomon and this maiden, and he's really in love with her. And this is probably then in his pre harem days before he had all the wives and concubines and uh, it goes on from there but it has a lot of the same problems as the three character view you can uh, read throughout the book read closely and poke holes in it it doesn't always fit and so really neither of these views are totally consistent and great explanations of what is going on in this different kind of biblical book and so here's my view for what it's worth. Um, it seems better to me to not try to explain too much of the book with one overarching explanation, with, with one sort of schema that we put, up, put on it. Um, and the way I think of it is this. What is the song? The song, and this is really profound, the song is a song. It is not a play. It is not a drama. It is a song, as it says in the first verse. The song of songs, that is the greatest song, which is to Solomon. So we need to take it as a song. Uh, maybe it's more than one song or more than one poem that's sort of put together in... Uh, what we have in these eight chapters. That's a possibility. Uh, we don't know. But it is a song. Certainly we know that. It's in poetry. It's in verse form. As a song, it is meant to be sung. Another profound point. And it is meant to be heard. And so, as it developed over time, this song was sung, and it was heard at the Israelite 
harvest festivals. Um, why the harvest festivals? Well, we may mention a reason or two here in a bit, but it, it became the song that you sang at harvest time. And as a song, it is, it is sort of the way we expect songs to be, cyclic, uh, repetitious. You know, there are refrains that come back again and again and that kind of thing. And we don't expect to take every phrase in every song 100% literally, do we? Um, so there are lots of images and, and metaphors and similes and words that have double meaning, sort of double entendre at time at times. Um, we said as for the book of, as a whole, we don't want to think that it's not really talking about what it's talking about because it is. So in that sense, it's not figurative, but there are a lot of figures in it and a lot of um, images and so forth, like we expect in poetry, like we expect in song lyrics. And another thing, and this is a point that I think sort of troubles us in the West, in our, our culture, we like logic and things sort of in an outline form that we can follow one, two, three, A, B, C. That is not... That is not what we get with the song, okay? And that's not what we get with a lot of the Old Testament, frankly. Um, but this song is really more sort of stream of consciousness than logical in the way it progresses. It's just sort of all these feelings and emotions that come uh, in, into the mind of the man and the woman. And um, so if you're looking for a neat, perfect, logical story, um, you're going to be frustrated by the song. This isn't a, a, a biblical book that would be very easy to put on film unless it was sort of one of those 60s or 70s movies uh, with with the spinning flowers and, and all that stuff, sort of weird movies. Um, this is stream of consciousness stuff. It is much more Eastern in its approach than it is Western. And we really need to keep in mind that the Bible came out of the East not the West. Uh, so I think that's a better way to approach it in general. And, and that will help us um, not be disappointed in what we, what we get. I just want to go through a few basic characteristics of the song that we keep saying. Some of these we mentioned last time and some of them we saw in the reading at the beginning. One, you'll see a lot of nature motifs. So, a lot of references to different kinds of flowers and um, animals and things. If you were uh, into such things as I am, it's like uh, translating from the original. A very hard book to translate because a lot of rare words and things that we're not sure exactly. What does that Hebrew word mean in English and how do we translate? Sometimes we're guessing uh, in those things. Thankfully, they're not tied to major doctrines that are important. But lots of nature motifs and, and that kind of thing. There are a lot of very vivid descriptions of the attraction that the woman has for the man and the man has for the woman. So they're talking about how much they like one another, how good looking they think each other are, and they very vividly describe that. Now, they may not be as quite uh, vivid to us in our perception because we're not familiar with some of the, the plants and the animals and so forth. Uh, but at one point she says of him, your legs are like alabaster columns. You know, uh, we would say something like, uh, you got strong legs. You look good in a pair of shorts, that kind of thing. That's the kind of things they say to one another, but in very flowery, uh, picturesque uh, images. Okay. There are a lot of perfumes and fragrances referred to throughout the book as they discuss uh, their attraction and, and sort of their love nest and things like that. There's a lot of royal terminology. So that's where a lot of people associate it with King Solomon. Um, there are different terms of that center around the king and his court and... Um, his kind of possessions and things. And then uh, a fifth thing is just a lot of, as we said, expressions of attraction and, and desire for one another. That's 
It's what it is. It's a love poem. Uh, a lot of the action of the book takes place in a garden. So um, in chapter two, a lot of garden scenes, chapters four and five, chapter six. Uh, as an example, let me share with you a verse in chapter six. Just to give you a, a, a taste of this. Chapter 6, verse 11, for instance, uh, it, it seems that she says, I went down to the nut orchard to look at the blossoms of the valley to see whether the vines had budded, whether the pomegranates were in bloom. And there's just one verse uh, where you have a reference to nuts and blossoms and vines and pomegranates. Um, that's very typical. A lot of action going on in gardens. Uh, also in chapter 7, uh, there's a garden scene. And then in the closing chapter, in chapter 8, uh, so as, as I listed those off, I got nearly every chapter of the book. These words close the book, chapter 8, verses 13 and 14. The first verse, he speaks, and then the second verse, she speaks. He says in verse 13, O oh, you who dwell in the gardens with companions listening for your voice, let me hear it. And then she says, as the book closes, make haste my beloved and be like a gazelle or a young stag on the mountains of spices. Again, uh, garden motifs and images throughout. We might remember that scripture begins in a garden, the garden of Eden. Uh, chapter 2 of Genesis, verses 18 through 25, you have uh, the action in the Garden of Eden and the first marriage where, where God creates Eve specifically for Adam and it pleases him. And, you know, they, they come together in the garden. Uh, it says at the end of that chapter, Genesis 2, 25, that they were naked and unashamed. And then... As the story goes on, they sin, and in, suddenly in chapter 3, verse 7, they realize they're naked and they're ashamed. So something changes uh, because of sin. It's almost like you can, you can sort of think of the Song of Solomon as almost restoring the innocence of that garden. Um, the bliss of Genesis chapter 2, verse 25, restored in, in Sol Song of Solomon. Uh, but that's, that's one way of thinking of a connection there across Scripture. Uh, there's another text that's parallel or sounds a lot like Song of Solomon in a book we've already gone through. That's the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 5, verse 15, uh, where the, the father is speaking to his son. Remember, he, he says, drink water from your own cistern. Flowing water from your own well, should your springs be scattered abroad, streams of water in the streets, let them be for yourself alone and not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth, a lovely deer, a graceful doe. It goes on in that vein, but it's language very similar to what we see in Song of Solomon. So Song of Solomon isn't the only place we get that kind of thing. Um, we get it throughout the wisdom literature in, in some spots. So one of the things that's often asked when, when you take the song in a more literal way, like, like we're suggesting here, is what exactly is going on in the relationship in this song? What is the relationship between these two in the song? Because if, you, if, you, if you're saying that what it sounds like they're saying is really what they're saying, rather than turning it into an allegory, um, talking about God's love for his church or, or his people. If it's really a love poem between two people, who are these people? More importantly, what's the nature of their relationship? Um, and what we need to realize, sadly, this has become a, a little more foreign in our culture, but... In that culture, most likely this couple is married, or at the very least, they are about to be married. They are, in other words, in their culture, betrothed. Um, 
and then at some point, maybe about the middle of the book, married, although it's hard to determine exactly at that where that point is. In Jewish culture, betrothal was much more serious than engagement in our culture. So, you know, people get engaged in, in our world, and we, we all know the people that have broken off engagements um, and, you know, and maybe been engaged several times, that kind of thing. But in Jewish culture, in the ancient culture, betrothal was much more serious. It was such a, a, a close bond and, and a serious commitment that in order to break it, you really had to file for divorce. That may seem strange to us in the way we think of marriage, but uh, that's how serious they took a betrothal. Once that commitment was made, um, to to dissolve it was to like have a divorce. And um, in the old law, the Old Testament law, it was extremely strict in matters of romance and, and commitment and marriage and so forth. Um, for instance. Sex before marriage was totally outside the law. It was forbidden in um, the Old Testament law. In fact, if that was violated, um, the male, the man, was actually required by law to marry the woman. I mean, if it was found that these two had come together in, in sexual intercourse, the man was required to marry the woman and to pay a price to her father, the bride price. Uh, you can see that exact law in Exodus chapter 22, verse 16. So um, that was a big penalty, we might say, uh, especially uh, the way people conduct themselves in, in our world. But that's how serious they took it. So in light of that, uh, we would say that very likely of the nature of this rela relationship was married or at, at the least betrothed. Um, adultery in that cult culture was an even more serious violation. So with adultery came the threat of, of the death penalty. Leviticus chapter 20 verse 10 very specifically says, uh, if it's found that the man and the woman have, have com committed, adult committed adultery, it's proven that they can be stoned to death. Um, so, needless to say, uh, they took it much more seriously than many do today. So, uh, although it's hard to say exactly at what point uh, this, this couple is married, maybe the entire book, but again, trying not to be too exact in this sort of stream of consciousness love poetry. It's, it's difficult to say when they're married, maybe the whole time, or they may be on the road to marriage at some point in the book. Um, certainly this is in the context of a, a marriage commitment and um, what they're expressing, expressing to one another um, is, is to be seen in that light. Uh, as it should be. Uh, if we think about the New Testament view, we talked about how the Old Testament law was so strict in these things, but the New Testament view is also very strict. Uh, in one sense, it's even more so. Uh, because Jesus, when he reflects on um, sexual temptation and, and sin and so forth, he introduces a, a new concept in his great sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. So if you look in Matthew chapter 5, just to show you that Jesus didn't lighten up any on this view of where uh, a sexual relationship belonged. Uh, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 27. Now, this is in a series of statements he makes where he's sort of comparing what they had always heard to what he was saying. So he'll say something like, you've heard it was said of old, you shall not murder. And then he says, but I say to you, anyone who is, you know, hates his brother um, is guilty. So he sort of ups the game in many of the laws. Uh, 
But he says something about this issue in Matthew chapter 5, verse 27. He's, he begins, he says, You've heard it was said, you shall not commit adultery. Well, that's one of the Ten Commandments. Of course, they had heard that. But Jesus steps it up and he says, But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And then he goes on and makes that sort of infamous statement. You know, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out, throw it away. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off, that kind of thing. Uh, but it starts with this, this idea where he introduces the concept of, what will we call it, mental adultery or heart adultery. Um, he, if anything, um, calls his disciples to an even higher standard. So although our world might snicker at what we read in Song of Solomon, um, Jesus, um, he took it seriously, just like the old law did. And, and so hopefully some of these things help us to uh, read this book a little more clearly. Uh, keeping in mind that we're dealing with love poetry, very descriptive, uh, emotional, um, describing how much they like one another and love one another and want to be together and, and that kind of thing. And um, it's really meant to be a beautiful thing, sort of a restoration of the original situation between Adam and Eve. Um, and and hopefully we can learn something from that aspect of it. Uh, there's just a, a few more things that we'll look at next time on this song. I, I encourage you to read through these eight chapters. It doesn't take a long time. Um, something I used to do with my college classes when, when I went through this book. It's a, a bit of a challenge to study with college students uh, because of the subject matter. Um, unfortunately, and, and we would sort of mark the song out almost as a play with the parts, he, she, and so forth. And, uh, we would take turns and, and read all the parts aloud, uh, and, and sort of listen to the, to the flow of the poetry. There was a time or two where, where, uh, we had uh, a few less mature students, that acted more like teenagers and college students and some of the, the imagery, imagery made them giggle and, and so forth. I'm sure they're much more mature these days. Uh, but uh, you might just try reading through it in a sitting and, and sort of see how this, this couple extols one another in the context of a very committed, faithful relationship, likely a marriage, at least a betrothal, and how this um, this relationship is God honoring in that way. Uh, it's often said that Song of Solomon is one of the books, one of about two uh, in the Bible that do not mention God. I think that's incorrect. And next time we'll look at the one place where I think God is mentioned toward the end of Song of Solomon. But it, he's not uh, named very often, May, maybe just one time. Um, but he, he is certainly uh, the author of it, you know, ultimately. So hope you have a great uh, rest of the evening. Thank you for, for studying along with us tonight. And um, may God add his blessings to our look at his book. Take care.